By now you've heard of Bitcoin, the world's first and biggest cryptocurrency, and the blockchain, its underlying technology, and how together they have the potential to change everything from record keeping to the global financial system. The blockchain is a radically transparent platform that allows people to trade with each other in a way that bypasses the need for traditional contracts and intermediaries. Bitcoin is free market money that runs on the internet and isn't controlled by a political entity or central bank. That sounds exciting as hell, but if you're like me, you struggle to understand exactly how a fully decentralized money and public ledger system are going to be implemented and brought to bear on everyday life. So meet Caitlin Long, one of Inc. Magazine's 10 business leaders changing the world through tech. You need a true, fair, free capital market in order to have a vibrant economy, and we don't have that today, and that's what we gain by blockchain. She's also a former managing director of Morgan Stanley and the current president of Symbiont, which is bringing blockchain technology to Wall Street. You became interested in the Austrian School of Economics in 2008 during the financial crisis. Yes. Why did it take the financial crisis to make you interested in the Austrian School, and what are its essential insights into kind of uh, Bitcoin or blockchain technology? Sure. It, I was in the industry for 16 years before the financial crisis happened, and the system worked pretty well. And even today, it still does. But that hiccup, I, I knew there was a bigger story than what we were reading in the mainstream press. And it was, ironically, Tim Geithner's um, interviews that he gave very close together, the first one of which he said interest rates were too low, and that's why the mortgage market imploded. Mm -hmm. And the second one, he said we should lower interest rates even more. And so that, you had somebody who clearly was talking out of both sides of his mouth yes. or didn't understand from minute to minute what was going on? Potentially both. Yeah. I, I don't know, but that's what got me curious. And I started asking all of my big thinker friends who, uh, who were more thoughtful about the way the system really worked. And one of them said, start reading the Mises Daily Mail mm -hmm. and you'll figure out how the Fed works. Because at, by that point, I knew the Fed was at the center of of the financial system, and there was something that just didn't quite make sense. So I went deep down the rabbit hole. So uh, what what is it about the Fed's role that you think was central to the um, to the financial crisis? And then how does the Austrian school kind of respond to that or, or you know, clarify that for you? Sure. And by the way, I didn't just go into Austrian school. I looked at everything because I just didn't accept the, the mainstream explanation. Uh, but, but, but what I figured out was that we didn't have a free market in money. And the most important price in the economy that should absolutely never be tampered with is the price of borrowing money. In other words, the interest rates. And specifically, it's the money market rate of interest that should always be free because that's what gives entrepreneurs the red, yellow, green signals uh -huh. as to which, in, which sector to invest in and over what tenor to invest, mm -hmm. uh, short term versus long term. And, and so the Fed, by manipulating interest rates and the money supply and things like that, it, yes. it screws with... We don't really know what money costs at any given point. That's exactly right. I, I do. I am confident in saying yeah. that interest rates would be a lot higher today, a lot uh, than they would be if if we lived uh, uh, than they are today. <laughs> um, if we actually had a free market in money, no question, because you'd have to compensate savers for the risk. So how do you? Know, um, so what about the Austrian school ap ap appeals to you? That there was an aha moment for me when I read an essay that had two graphs that described, it was just simple supply demand uh, for, for money, and it showed uh, the, the, the disconnect, the Hayekian triangle was really what it was in a simplistic form, and it showed the disconnect and made me realize, oh my gosh, there's no question that uh, supply and demand for borrowing money are out of whack and that rates should be higher. And by, by rates being lower, we're, we are subsidizing capital destruction and it just was coming out, of course, with a vengeance at that point. Uh, but we're back at it. We're doing the same thing today. Um, now, the Austrians, though, also tend to believe, uh, you know, they hate fiat currency and they love the gold standard. Mm. Do you believe in a gold standard because you're a big Bitcoin blockchain person? And it mm. seems like the gold bugs and the Bitcoin people don't get along very well. Yes, it's so true. It's fascinating because uh, I'll be at Austrian events and folks will come running up to me. How is this? How does this work again? And I think it's because 
the, uh, the it, it, Bitcoin fits in the, in the Mengerian definition of mm -hmm. money better than it fits in the Misesian definition of money. I'm really in the weeds Yeah, now no, that's, yeah, <laughs> but, like, okay, yeah. Right, Carl but, with a K, Menger, yeah. Uh, but Jeffrey so, Tucker uh, yeah. wrote a tremendous essay in uh, 2014 explaining how Bitcoin actually does fit with Mises regression mm -hmm. theory of money. And I think he's right that the value, the use value of Bitcoin mm -hmm. isn't just the coin itself. It's that Bitcoin is intertwined with a payment system. Mm -hmm. And so you've got the, the unit of value, a small b Bitcoin, along with the payment system itself, capital B Bitcoin, and they're intertwined. And mm -hmm. that's that that that's what the Austrians could use if they if they so chose. And it's just that in the 19th century or 20 early 20th century, it was gold that performed that function. Right. And and actually, uh, it, you, you asked earlier what 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 should be money. My answer is whatever the free market says money is. So I, I I don't necessarily advocate a return to the gold standard. Though, as you and I were chatting before the interview, there are some central banks that are. Mm -hmm. quietly stockpiling gold, going the exact opposite direction as, as other central banks in the world. And I find that fascinating because mm -hmm. they understand that backing a fiat currency with real assets may someday have value, even though today it's certainly not mm -hmm. part of the zeitgeist of central banks to do that. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, symbiont and smart contracts, yes. um, because that's what one of the ways you describe it is that it's a smart contract company. Yes. Aren't all contracts smart, or at, <laughs> at least for one of the people, maybe the person writing it or the person signing it, what do you mean by smart contract? Smart contract is, is a piece of code that autonomously runs, and it, it's essentially an automated if-then statement. Um, what we interact with that might feel like a smart contract today is something like online banking. So on the 30th of the month, the computer hits the atomic clock mm -hmm. and says, uh, time to pay your utility bill. If there's money in your account, the bill gets paid, and you don't intervene at all. Now, that's not really a smart contract in the blockchain context, because when you run that smart contract on a blockchain, what happens is that the payment goes immediately to mm -hmm. the payee. Right now, you've got that sexy front end of, of online bill pay. Most users probably think they're actually paying their bill at the moment that they set that up or at the, when the computer hits the atomic clock on the 30th of the month. But in reality, the payment is going through a spaghetti labyrinth behind the scenes before it ends up at the payee. And they get it usually the next day and sometimes even longer, depending upon if it's a foreign exchange payment. So, so smart contract is essentially autonomous computer programs. It will feel like uh, like an online bill pay that automates workflows that used to be manual, but it's going to be on steroids relative to what we and experience it'll, today. It'll be instantaneous or, instantaneous or virtually. Or, in, uh, yeah. yeah, these as, are distributed systems. So there's a, there is latency. Mm -hmm. The speed of light is the right. limitation on how fast data right. can move. So there is latency. Uh, it, they're not always going so to be in sync So this means, I think, if, if I'm remembering the theory of relativity, my twin who goes out to Alpha Centauri, he'll owe me a lot of money by the time he comes back, <laughs> there you go. even though I'm an old man or he's an old man. <laughs> So another way of talking about this is that it's a distributed ledger system. Mm -hmm. So uh, explain how, I mean, that seems very close to the kind of smart contract, but it's that the payment will be put through the system and everybody will be able to account for it you know, immediately. Yes, it's a, the distributed ledger is mm -hmm. essentially the golden ledger. That's the aha mm -hmm. of Bitcoin. That is the payment system that Satoshi Nakamoto invented that enables multiple parties to see the same data at essentially the same time and trust that it's valid. Mm -hmm. When we say essentially the same time, we're talking yeah, millis yeah. milliseconds right. of latency. But that's the aha, that, that multiple untrusting parties who may not even know each other mm -hmm. uh, and certainly don't necessarily trust each other right. can share one and only one copy of data and trust that it's valid. Right. Um, you spend a lot of time talking to risk managers and insurance companies. Uh, last year, you gave a speech to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which sounds like the most boring conference of all time, <laughs> uh, but where you said that blockchain technology could fix, and I'm quoting you, the lack of beneficial ownership tracking of securities by the securities industry. Now, yes. the content of the speech is, is really fascinating, but are you saying that people in, in the stocks and bonds business don't really have any idea of who owns what? That's exactly right. Okay. And so like, that's really scary, right? Uh, it, 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 it is, and it should be. Most people don't understand that so again. So explain, how, how is it? Because like every, I think everybody thinks they know who owns this or that. Right. What we own in our brokerage accounts is an IOU from our broker-dealer, just like what we own in our bank account is an IOU from our bank. We don't really own our bank deposits, just like we don't really own the stocks. The, the company that owns the stocks is a company called the DTC, or technically a 
a subsidiary called Feedy and Company. Uh, it's the biggest company that nobody has ever heard of. And frankly, it owns 99.9% .9 of the securities outstanding. And we think we have a capitalist system. Mm -hmm. Pause on that and think about that. Um, how difficult would it be for that entity to, to be taken over by a hostile actor? Pause on that. Uh, but let's leave that aside and presume that doesn't happen. Um, so they literally, it's a bookkeeping entity. It's something called a, a clearinghouse mm -hmm. that was created back in the 70s by the SEC to try to allow netting of securities transactions in a, in a market where, where too many trades were happening to move the physical securities mm -hmm. around fast enough. Right. And so they allowed for, it's almost like the Wells Fargo stagecoaches uh, back uh, in the 1800s with payments. Instead of moving all the cash, they just netted the right. buys, the, the incomes and outgoes, the debits and credits, and just moved the net amount of cash as a means by which to try to reduce risk in the system. And at the time, it helped. But what we're stuck with now, 40 years later, is a market structure that requires all trades to clear through that central mm -hmm. organization, which is part of the reason why it takes a lot of time to clear trades. And How long does it take to clear a typical trade? Well, we just went from T plus three to T plus two. In other words, trade date plus two days. Right. Uh, but of course, technology would enable us essentially mm -hmm. in real time to clear those trades. And, so we're and stuck and with that legacy how does structure. I mean, is it that people don't know who owns something at any given moment in time? Or yes. is it more kind of long term than that? And, well, and, you know, that, well, we think we bought this company, but there are so many intermediaries that we're, we're not really there. That's right. The accounting systems can get out of whack. And it's a function of the, the latency and the number of intermediaries through which uh, the transactions have to go. And that's why you, it, the system occasionally does lose track of who really owns what. I've encountered mm -hmm. it in my in my business when I worked uh, uh, on the street working with a pension fund where there was securities mm -hmm. lending happening that was unauthorized. Uh, and they wouldn't have discovered it but for the fact we were working on a pension transaction. Um, and then, of course, there, there are a number of instances where naked short selling has mm -hmm. been revealed. But the most uh, prominent one is the Dole Food case that just came out of the Delaware Tr Chancery Court in February of this year. There were 36.7 million shares of Dole Food outstanding and 49.2 million applications with valid brokerage statements for those 36.7 wow. million shares outstanding. So that delta between 36.7 mm. and 49.2 was just phantom shares that were created from the accounting system out of thin air. Wow, so it's like stock, all time stock watering, but this is fully within the system. It's fully yeah. within the system. It's, mm. it's fractional reserving within securities yeah. as opposed to fractional reserve banking, which is what the Austrian school was. So you've, so you've right written uh, yeah, that the, the biggest beneficiaries of blockchain technology are long only investors, yeah. uh, insurance companies, Companies, pension funds, mutual funds, and mom and pop investors. They're the biggest losers from today's lack of beneficial ownership tracking yes. in the securities industry. Walk through how blockchain technology fixes this. It, it restores the property right back to those of us who think we actually own what we think we own today, but don't. So, I mean, in that case of, of Dull Foods, mm -hmm. there's no way that there could be more shares outstanding exactly. than were actually created exactly. at any given time because everything gets accounted for immediately or you know at the speed of light well and we also can track it we own it so if somebody is actually out there doing something with our securities that aren't authorized then we would know we would be able to see it this is one of the things i find fascinating about blockchain uh, bitcoin and blockchain is that it, when it when bitcoin really emerged one of the th and particularly on kind of dark websites like silk road and whatnot the idea mm. that it was fully anonymous cash like transactions um, but in fact it's not it's, it's the not re reverse of fully anonymous it is fully tied to specific individuals specific institutions specific moments in time um, you know is that um, does that trouble you at all well, it's tied to IP yeah. addresses, yeah. right? Which is right. how it, it's pseudonymous. I yeah. think is a is a is a, okay. a more accurate term. Uh, does it trouble me? It depends on the use case, mm -hmm. right? Um, because in it, let's put it this way: uh, for those who are looking for better privacy in Bitcoin, there are next generation mm -hmm. projects that have come out: Zcash, Monero, with much greater levels of anonymity. Right. Uh, but in the institutional world. This is exactly the sort of thing that we want. We want to be able to have clarity on who really owns what. And so the shenanigans that have happened in the, in the industry, which have skimmed value off people's securities accounts, 
un, un, undetectably. Hmm. Uh, those sorts of shenanigans need to stop. So within the institutional world, that transparency is a good thing because right. guess what? Today we don't have it at all. Mm -hmm. no, it's it's not. Nobody knew until the very end that there were that many extra shares of dull food outstanding. So this is and this is probably a stretch, but this is kind of like there's going to be moments in the institutional investing world where we open the safe and it's like Geraldo Rivera going into Al Capone's vault, <laughs> and what we thought was stockpiled with good old fashioned booze, there's like and nothing, there's nothing there. there yeah, right. you know, or then, or there's. You know, a bunch of bears that are about to eat you or something like that. <laughs> well, in, in the financial crisis, as we were talking about earlier, one of the things that clearly happened was the repo market seized. And it was a it was a bank run. It was not a bank run like we expected, where people were lined up during the depression, mm -hmm. you know, around the block waiting to take their bank, their money out of out of the bank. And we realized what fractional reserve banking was. This was fractional reserve banking in the treasury bond market. Mm -hmm. And it happened electronically. It was a bank run electronically. And there's an, uh, an economist at the IMF who's tried to get a handle on how many extra treasury securities have been created out of thin air, mm -hmm. it, it just because of the way the accounting systems of Wall Street work. And he, he calls it the velocity of collateral. I won't go into the details mm -hmm. about why he calls it that. But in plain English, what that means is how many times has one institution who owns a treasury bond, lent it to someone else who also reports that they own it, uh, who's lent it to someone else who also reports that they own it. So you've got three, and that's the number he came up with. It used to be four. Now it's three institutions who are all reporting that they own the very same mm -hmm. treasury bond when there's really only one. Hmm. This is how the Fed is conducting monetary policy in today's day and age. I think that the Austrian school is, is stuck in the old traditional banking system where it's all about money hmm. and M0, M1, M2, et cetera. It's now being done through treasury bonds in what's called rehypothecation, and but it's exactly the same pattern where you're creating phantom assets that don't exist no. and allowing the accounting systems to get out of whack to do that. Um, you know, Wall Street is famously averse to any sort of reform, whether it's imposed by the government or it you know bubbles up through the markets. Um, uh, how, you know, how is it reacting to blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, and associated technologies? Well, this is funny because I was working, running a business inside Morgan Stanley when I discovered Bitcoin and then discovered blockchain. And believe it or not, in the beginning, I was I had kept my head down, assuming, like Jamie Dimon just recently said, that you know anyone involved in Bitcoin would be fired. That was my right. presumption that that was going to happen at that point in time. But but shockingly, um, what happened is as this got going. The mainstream folks actually reached out to people like me at mm -hmm. the different firms. They found us through an internal Bitcoin forum. The chief technology officer of Morgan Stanley reached out and said, hey, you know something about this. Come talk to me. And I was running a business. So he trusted me and mm -hmm. uh, pulled me into a group of five people who vetted everything that came through. Can, any, can it be good if Morgan Stanley is interested in it? I mean, uh, I mean, is it just going to be co-opted into maintaining the status quo? No. Well, there are going to be attempts of that. Um, there are backdoor attempts of that, right? So, so there are a number of projects that are supported by the incumbents that have come out and admitted they're blockchain inspired. But um, in, in other words, not, not truly blockchain. Uh, but, but if you adhere to the principle of decentralization, mm -hmm. you can't Co have a central actor co-opt it. And that's what's so interesting about the approach of Symbian to the marketplace. We're looking for places within the market that are naturally decentralized. And oh, by the way, guess what? Most markets are naturally decentralized. Mm -hmm. Most markets are naturally peer-to-peer. -peer. When I'm paying my utility bill, why does there have to be anybody inter in intermediating between mm -hmm. my utility and me? Right. So over time, I think that decentralization will actually tip so, so yeah, what are what are markets then that um, you know say Wall Street is particularly interested in keeping decentralized or bringing decentralization back? Because it seems like Wall Street. I mean, the whole idea of you know we're we're talking in New York. It was con it's concentrated in a few block area or was for yeah. for centuries really or tr the trading districts. Mm -hmm. uh, they want centralization, don't they? Well, for that. It was concentrated for simply because they had to move the paper stock certificates mm -hmm. around. That's that's settlement was when I delivered you the actual paper stock certificate. Now that's that's no longer the case. Um, but but I, I think that that Dodd Frank actually pushed and pushed us in a direction of centralization. Ironically, they missed an incredible opportunity to push decentralization and make the financial sector healthier. Uh, they did do some things right in, in increasing the capital requirements. So there are certain things that have gotten better about the financial system. But the, the, those central organizations have become ensconced. Mm -hmm. And anytime you get somebody who's just, you know, stick in the mud, ensconced, we are not going to change. 
Um, that, that's an incumbent that is difficult to disrupt. Uh, so there are lots of examples of, of central actors like that. But I do believe what will happen over time is that decentralization will, will show that it's that much more efficient and actually that, le that much less risky. And that th th the market will eventually uh, move in that direction naturally. You know, as a, philo uh, I mean, kind of a philosophical, sociological, economic observation, though, one of the things that is great about capitalism as it, you know, as we generally talk about it, is the role of intermediaries. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people don't understand the value of what they own over here uh, versus what it would bring over here. Um, intermediaries often are the people who create value. And this is, you know, the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe mm -hmm. is, you know, traced specifically to their being involved in capital markets. Uh, the overseas Chinese are intermediaries. They're shopkeepers. They're people who import something to a place uh -huh. where it has more value. Is, you know, in that sense, does blockchain kind of, you know, is it is it a threat to capitalism as we understand it and that essential function of the intermediary? No. And in, by the way, intermediaries won't entirely go away. So you're talking about the example of shopkeepers. They won't they won't go away if they add value hmm. by creating a marketplace, you know, a grocery store where I know I can go get my various and sundry items in one place. I don't have to go to lots of different places. That's that's a service that that is valuable. Um, and the same thing will be true of other intermediaries. I don't think that the investment banks, for example, will completely go away. They, they do provide a real value in bringing buyers and sellers together. The stock exchanges provide value in bringing buyers and sellers together. Look at it in the Bitcoin world. There are now cryptocurrency exchanges that bring buyers and sellers together. There's value. But what they're doing is taking a fee. This is the big difference. In today's day and age, what they're doing is running the assets through their balance sheet and taking a cut of the value. And oh, by the way, if Lehman Brothers goes bust before your trade settles, uh-oh, you're suddenly a creditor of Lehman. You thought you were buying a share of stock and suddenly you've got an IOU from a, a bankrupt institution. That's the piece that will, that will and should go away. There's absolutely no reason why financial inst intermediaries need to have our assets moving through their balance sheets on the way between buyer and seller of a financial asset. Um, you, uh, you've written about how uh, nobody knows how leveraged the economy really is. Yeah. Um, explain why that, uh, you know, why that presents risk. And obviously, blockchain addresses it by kind of clarifying who owns what at any given moment. Yeah. So this gets, gets back to what I was talking about in the treasury bond market, where there are three treasury bonds owned, um, reported as owned by every, uh, for every one treasury bond that actually exists. Mm. Um, that makes each financial institution look solvent, but if you actually try to pull out the double counting, guess what? The financial system is not as solvent as it appears, right? And the Austrians would say it's actually not solvent at all if, if everybody were to actually grab their assets and, um, and, and take them home, so to speak. Uh, so if the musical chairs ever stop, you realize just how insolvent the system is. And, it, and just like a traditional banking system works that way, so does the securities industry. It works that way. And so the, the challenge, and actually there's a, there's a regulator, Chris John Carlo at the CFTC, who's been a big and early supporter of blockchain. He's the one who's out there saying, hey, this is the tool that will allow regulators to, to realize just how leveraged the financial system really is. So he's, he's out there admitting this, not from an ideological per perspective, but from a practical perspective. Do you think most um, regulators, either uh, kind of would-be uh, regulators uh, like uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren or the actual people who are going through financial ledgers and balance sheets, do they understand that? Um, and are, are they asking the right questions and just giving the wrong answers, or are they not even asking the right questions? Uh, look, I was in the industry for 16 years in the weeds uh, mm -hmm. before I figured it out. So I think a lot of people probably don't uh, understand it. Yeah. Uh, but there are some who do. Um, you know, and you asked about Senator Warren, uh, that, that, that wing of the, of the Democratic Party has diagnosed the problem correctly, just like the Rod Paul wing of the Republican Party has. And it's that really that a, there's a fundamental, I mean, you would argue that there's a kind of fundamental fraud going on in our financial system. Well, to the extent that multiple institutions are, are reporting that they own the same asset at the yeah. same time when there's really only one asset, what would you call that? Yeah. I would like to uh, get in on that action before it, it <laughs> collapses. But, well, well, that's what the hedge yeah. funds have done. That's yeah. what they figured out, right? All these folks in the Dole Food case, how many people got a free double uh, dip yeah. and stole value from mom and pop? Sometimes I wonder whether when they see those opportunities to sort of arb the system mm -hmm. because the system doesn't keep accurate track and they knew they wouldn't 
uh, get caught mm -hmm. or, or presumed they wouldn't get caught. I wonder how many of the folks who are doing that actually stop and think about what that mm -hmm. means. And that is part of the settlement process for kind of stock trades. Mm -hmm. I mean, by uh, you, you were talking about, uh, you know, T plus three down to T plus two, and that can become, you know, basically where the trade is instantaneous. Mm -hmm. um, what what is the issue uh, with the stock trades taking so long to settle? What what kind of you know what kind of uh, funny business goes on between them? It's a market structure issue. So we talked about the creation of the DTC. Don't need the DTC anymore from a technology perspective because we could settle trades instantly between buyers and sellers or their agents, like a brokerage firm, a brokerage firm. But what happens is right now, literally, each institution that touches a stock trade. Is, pro is sequentially processing that trade. So from your broker to the custodian, then the custodian has to sequentially process at the DTC, then they sequentially process to the next custodian to the broker. So that's five institutions who are touching a trade, literally having it run through their balance sheet. So again, they're leveraged institutions. If, if anything fails in that chain, you, you're, you're stuck with an IOU. Uh, and each one has to be processed in sequence. That's, that's why yeah. under the current market structure, it's really tough to speed this up because five institutions have to process something in sequence. Are there specific uh, you know, illegalities that creep into the system that you can talk about? Well, the, the, the naked short selling mm -hmm. is, is technically illegal. And explain right? that for that's where you... It's where you, where, where you create. Uh, securities are lent out and it's not required to find an actual security, you just have to um, uh, verify that you could borrow it if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. So you can see how there's room for interpretation on how many securities there are outstanding. And so if you get a borrow, you can borrow the shares. That creates a phantom share of stock if it's not tied to an actual share of stock. That is illegal. Uh, and our friend Patrick Byrne at Overstock.com 10 plus years ago really made a lot of noise about that because you can see how that artificially suppresses the price of a security. Again, this gets back to how the, the, you know, the mechanisms in the, in the capital markets that skim value unfairly from mom and pop. Because nobody is quite sure who owns what at any given point in time. There are too many shares outstanding, yeah. right? And, and it, you know, back then, it, it really um, did suppress the value of Overstock's um, shares. But and it, I believe that Patrick had to sell some assets at a, at a fire sale value at the time. But now, short selling is not a bad thing, right? Short selling is no. also a way. So why is, of liquidity. why is naked short selling bad? Because it creates phantom shares, right? So if, I, if I'm going to short a share of stock, as long as I can tie my short to the actual share of stock, that's, 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 that, there's tremendous value. And, and pension funds and insurance companies do securities lending all the time, and they can collect extra income for that. That's absolutely legitimate and should be done all day. And about 20% of the trades in the securities markets are done on a short basis. Right. So it's very much a part of the liquidity in the market. Where it starts to become a gray area is when you're allowed to say, well, gosh, maybe the, I don't have an actual share of stock. I can point to one over there, but that one might also have been pointed to by somebody else. And that's how you get into the accounting being out of whack and value being skimmed off. Uh, last year, you made a prediction that involved uh, Overstock.com, uh, Patrick Burns' company, uh, who is you know one of the great uh, kind of evangelists for Bitcoin mm -hmm. and blockchain, especially. Uh, the prediction was that Overstock would issue public securities that exist only in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. In December, uh, last December, they did just yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, why is that a good thing? Or wh what does that prove? Well, that paved a trail for the rest of us to follow because they went through the SEC approval process. That is an SEC registered security. Full disclosure, I own it personally. Mm -hmm. um, and Overstock uh, in summer of this year made an investment in my company. So mm -hmm. full disclosure, sure. we're philosophically aligned and working on some things together. But um, but that blazed the trail for other issuers to follow the, mm -hmm. the legal documentation that Overstock went through the heavy lifting to get approval to do. Uh, now that security doesn't trade very much because mm -hmm. it actually is in this in this one place. You have to have an account with that one brokerage firm. And so the next generation versions of those securities will be more liquid and trade in, in, more, in more venues. Tell me a bit about how different national banks um, are starting to use Bitcoin or blockchain technology to transform uh, you know, their business. Uh, and, and particularly uh, the Russian National Bank seems to be doing something, or Central Bank rather, yeah. um, you know, that is uh, forward-looking in a way. You know, we don't associate Russia 
with anything other than looking back at, you know, either the czars or, or the communists. <laughs> right. Well, it's so fascinating. Russia itself is a country that's tended to be on a different cycle than the rest of the world because they haven't been as connected to uh, the, 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 the OECD type um, countries. And of course, they've in the last 10 years been frozen out because of sanctions from the global financial system. And so uh, it, it isn't a shock to me that Russia is the first central bank that came out and said that there will be a crypto ruble. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how they will be implementing it, but uh, it remains to be seen. I look at, at the fact that Russia's been buying gold in its central bank. All the Keynesian economists were saying you should, uh, when, the, when the ruble had a, a rough patch a couple of years ago, the Keynesian economists, the IMF were telling them, sell your gold, protect the value of the ruble. And no, they just let it drop. And they actually bought gold at that point in time. It's how, fascinating. How does uh, you know? How does a country like Russia, which is a, a low trust society to begin with, and then in the international markets, it's very uh, sketchy. I mean, yeah. if, um, how will uh, blockchain technology or crypto rubles first? Will they be able to make people actually confident that there's something there, or this is mm. just another scam? Uh, but secondly, how will that transform the internal politics of Russia, which is a very secretive, closed society? Yeah, well, I spent, uh, I did the Trans-Siberian Express last year, oh, wow. so I uh, spent a lot of time. I'm fascinated by the history of the country. Is the it better, better than Amtrak or about the same? Uh, well, you know, it's, I've got to tell you, it, Russia's vast. It is, it is, I think, one and a half times the width of the United States. I mean, it, there are, in, when you're in Siberia, there's right. a lot of... Uh, uh, it, it, a, a lot of there, it, let's put it this way: um, tra train is the method of transportation because the highways are just it's too sparsely populated for big for big highways, um, and and so. It, but but what I saw was a tremendous amount of commerce and especially a lot of oil tankers yeah. on the train tracks. Uh, but but back in, on on your question about the crypto ruble, ruble, it all depends on how they implement it. If they implement it in a means by which you can verify that the central bank became a money warehouse and it's backed one for one with something real. And Russia, remember, is a very rich nat natural resource economy. So in addition to having bought a lot of gold, they and China have been buying gold from the other central banks in the world in the last 10 years in large size. Uh, so, so they could actually back their currency with something real if they so choose. So it's going to be interesting to see how they implement it. Is that kind of ironic, though, that a crypto ruble needs to be backed by gold coins sitting in a, in a vault somewhere? Well, essentially, it becomes an electronic version yeah. of whatever is on the central bank's balance sheet, mm -hmm. as long as it's one for one. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, and of course, you know, a lot of the mainstream economists would be probably scratching their heads listening to mm. us right now saying, why on earth would that matter? Well, it would matter because all of a sudden, if you're capital goes to the place where it's treated best. Mm -hmm. And if the central bank is not going to dilute you by playing shenanigans like we were talking about in the in the government bond markets around the world, namely the treasury market here, but that it happens in all the government bond markets in the OECD countries where there are more government bonds than there actually exist mm -hmm. uh, in the accounting systems. So yeah, it depends on if, if Russia implements it in a one-for-one -one manner. When will the rest of us realize that you know the blockchain has won? I think it's when you see big financial institutions deploying it as a means by which to create a shared back office and mm -hmm. take, a, take out all of the expense and the risk and the latency in settling transactions and essentially becoming service providers that enable the peer-to-peer -peer market. And we wouldn't necessarily, in our interactions with the blockchain, know that there is a blockchain because what we'll see is just a nice web-based front end, like we experienced well, today. We already have, yeah. With uh, with online banking, but what will? But the difference is when you send money to your friend on Venmo, they're going to get the money right away, as opposed to ha waiting until the money shows up the next day. Right. If you if you deposit a check in the bank today, you, it's it's usually T plus three before you get access to your funds, um, and that's because of those intermediaries that we're talking about on a blockchain basis. This, you'll get it instantly. I got to tell you, the prank phone caller in me is not looking forward to the future in the same way that call caller ID ended prank phone calls. This is. <laughs> You know, there's a lot, let's yeah. let's have a moment of silence for what we'll lose in a perfectly transparent financial system. Well, and a very fast financial system, right? For sure. But 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 this is this is you need a capital market in order to have a vibrant economy. You need a true, fair, free capital market where most, especially, interest rates are set by the voluntary interaction of buyers and sellers of borrowing and and uh, and lending money. And we don't have that today. And that's what we gain by blockchain.
Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you. We've been talking with Caitlin Long. She's a Bitcoin and blockchain enthusiast, and she's the president of Symbian. Thanks again for talking to us. Thanks, Nick. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie.